So before the break, I spoke about the dual fuel concept that we've been working on uh, recently that we call reactivity controlled compression ignition. Using the genetic algorithm optimization tools and the, comp the CFD models that I've described, we uh, came up with a strategy that basically involves two injections of diesel fuel into the premixed gasoline. The first one that conditions the octane number in the squish region uh, above the piston. Uh, and then the second one injected into the bowl that actually uh, serves as the ignition source. And, you know, uh, w when we first uh, discussed this with people, I said, oh, nobody's going to want two fuels. And we said, well, already diesel engines are using two fuels. There's diesel fuel and there's diesel exhaust fluid. Um, so why not have two fuels that you can go to the pump and get directly? And you've got two tanks anyway. Fill one with gasoline, one with diesel. So it, was, it seemed like... So uh, just an idea that um, instinctively people didn't like, but then when they thought about it, hmm, yeah, maybe there's something here. So we're still trying to um, explore the uh, justification for using two fuels, and I'll tell you more about that as we move along. Anyway, um, so this was done with the computer model, and so we went to the lab to try to verify the results that we were seeing. And we had two engine uh, engines in our lab. We actually have 18 engines at the Engine Research Center, but two of them were available. A heavy-duty Caterpillar single-cylinder oil test engine with a displacement of 2.4 liters, and a light-duty diesel engine from an automotive uh, GM 1.9 liter engine with a displacement of about half a liter. Here are the pistons you see. And <coughs> actually, we had been doing a project with Caterpillar at the time where we made the geometry of the pistons identical so that basically, uh, as far as the CFD code was concerned, they were the same engine. They just had a different bore. And we were studying engine size scaling. So we used the results from that engine size scaling to help us select the injectors. Uh, for instance, uh, we see here that uh, the hole size on the small engine was um, smaller than that on the large engine. And what these, n these numbers uh, uh, allowed us to do was to make sure that the spray penetration distance as a function of crank angle was the same in both engines uh, and also the lifted flame was uh, at the same location. So those are just uh, details. Basically we used the same strategy, namely we had um, uh, injection timings that were similar for the two pulses of the diesel fuel uh, in both engines. There were differences, the compression ratio is slightly different. The small bore engine had higher swirl ratio, uh, but other than that, um, the two engines are uh, quite similar. So I'm going to show you results from the heavy duty engine first. Um, so here we're operating the engine in the lab with 9 bar uh, IMEP, 1300 RPM. We're running with EGR in this case, I'll talk more about that later. And what we did was vary the percentage of gasoline in the port fuel injected fuel. The, the port fuel injected gasoline from 76% of the total fuel to 89%. The rest of the fuel would be the diesel fuel that's injected in two pulses, one at 58 before top dead center that preconditions the octane number uh, above the piston, and then the second injection, 37 before top dead center that injects into the bowl and serves as the ignition site. The amount of fuel in the first pulse was 62%. Uh, the compression ratio was 16 to 1 in the configuration we had here. So here I'm showing you the pressure trace versus crank angle for these three different fueling rates or gasoline uh, diesel ratios, if you like. And what you see is that as I increase the amount of gasoline, I'm able to phase the combustion later. Well, obviously, re uh, the reactivity of gasoline is less than that of diesel fuel. And so uh, this is uh, a, a one of the control mechanisms that you have available to you now. The other thing that we notice is we could control the duration of the combustion by playing with the details of the injection here. In other words, we could change the amount of fuel in each of these pulses and control the injection, the uh, combustion duration. So if we had run the engine with just gasoline, it wouldn't have run at all. We would have just had the motoring trace because gasoline is just not reactive enough at these conditions to produce combustion. 
And then this shows what the models predicted would happen if we had run the engine with just diesel fuel at this fueling rate. We would have had very early combustion and very high pressurized rates. In fact, when I took uh, these, uh, this concept down to the lab and I asked the students to run the engine with two fuels, they refused. Uh, they said it's going to blow up. And they're right. If we had run with the wrong proportion of gasoline and diesel, the engine would have blown up. So this really shows how important it is to have the CFD modeling uh, because that really guided the experimentalists uh, in this situation. The other thing to notice is we were able to use very low injection pressures. Since these experiments, we've even shown you can run with a gasoline direct injection, a GDI injector, instead of a diesel common rail, and still get similar results. So the experiments are shown in black. The dotted lines here are the, the simulations done before the experiments. So this is really cool, right? Very good agreement uh, ahead of time. And what we show is that you can control the start of combustion timing and the pressure rise rate or the duration of combustion by varying the details of the injection. Uh, the dual fuel strategy then can be used to extend the load limits. So you can go from no combustion to too violent combustion, which would be the cases with either of the two fuels by themselves. So uh, we also published data uh, a few years ago showing the other side of the coin, namely that this uh, low temperature combustion strategy also provides highly efficient combustion with low emissions. So I'm showing here, you here gross efficiency versus engine load going from light load uh, to high load. Uh, and the blue data here, the tri blue triangles, shows what happens when you run with gasoline as the port fuel injected fuel and diesel as the direct injected fuel using the recipe that I just showed you. You see that we can get efficiencies in the 54%. This is the gross indicated uh, thermal efficiency uh, with gasoline diesel uh, as shown here. But at the same time, we're able to keep the soot that comes out of the engine without any after treatment below the heavy duty target uh, 2010 levels and the NOx way below the heavy duty target in, uh, emission levels. So this was very exciting because basically an engine could operate more efficiently than a standard diesel engine and I'll show you those results in more detail later while simultaneously uh, reducing the engine out emissions without the need for that expensive after treatment that we spoke about that's equal to the cost of the engine. All right? So this seems like uh, it would be um, a potentially interesting concept. The other thing that we found was that there's considerable fuel flexibility. For example, here the green data is running the engine with E85, uh, that's 85% ethanol mixed with 15% gasoline for the port fuel injected fuel, and then diesel fuel for the direct injected fuel. And here we were able to get very high efficiencies um, I'll show you more uh, data a little bit later, uh, but we can approach 60% thermal efficiency depending on the fuel choices. But the fact is that because it can run on any two fuels that have a suitably different reactivity, you have an incredible amount of fuel flexibility. And that's shown with the purple data here, where we ran the engine with gasoline uh, in the port fuel injected fuel and gasoline mixed with a cetane improver in the direct injected fuel. Uh, here we used 3%, 3.5% of 2-EHN, uh, ethyl hexyl nitrate. Um, now you've got to remember that the directed, direct injected fuel is only 10 or 20% of the total fuel amount. So 3% uh, of that 10 or 20% works out to be on the order of 1% or so of cetane improver added to the, total, uh, to the total fuel used by the engine. This is less additive than you would need with an SCR DEF system, diesel exhaust fluid system. So if you're going to be using some sort of diesel exhaust fluid, why not consider using uh, gasoline, Just run the engine on gasoline, and create the reactivity gradients using uh, a cetane improver that allows you to simulate uh, the diesel fuel. So here it just shows some of the molecular arrangements of those cetane improvers. Uh, 
initially, yeah. Uh, and uh, then, of course, in the lab, you can make small changes and, and learn your way uh, uh, how to improve the performance. OK, so basically, this allows you to control HCCI. Because with HCCI, essentially, for a given set of conditions, there's only one ignition timing. Here we have a new knob. We can change the ratio of the two fuels and the details of how we mix them to get another knob. Uh, as you can see from this picture here, taken from experimental heat release profile, the combustion occurs in three phases or three stages. You have the more reactive uh, fuel. In this case, we were running with N-heptane isooctane surrogates. Uh, the more uh, reactive fuel ignites first. You see the low temperature chemistry here. Then you see a burn where basically the N-heptane that has been mixed with the isooctane as it's injected uh, burns in its uh, second stage combustion. And then finally, the burnout of the less reactive fuel uh, takes place. And so if you kind of want to just visualize that uh, qualitatively, basically the, the more reactive fuel would be the N-heptane. The mixture of N-heptane and isooctane, or diesel and gasoline, would be burning next. And then finally, the less reactive fuel. So this plot here is a really imp important one. It shows that we could run this RCCI concept with a single injection, actually. This is an injection at 50 degrees before top dead center. And keep the combustion timing fixed at 2 degrees after top dead center even though the intake gas temperature was changed over almost 100 degrees of centigrade, from 80 degrees to 170 degrees centigrade. How did we do that? We kept the combustion phasing constant by changing the ratio of gasoline and diesel. So this just shows the control that's possible by having these two fuels. You can keep combustion exactly where you want it, even if the intake temperature is varying over wide ranges. If you had just a single PRF number, you'd be at one point on this vertical axis here. And there'd be only one temperature of the intake that would allow you to get combustion phased at that crank angle. But by having this ability to change the, the fuel PRF uh, globally, you can control when combustion takes place. So in order to further understand the RCCI combustion process, we also have performed some experimental day, uh, experimental tests with uh, optical um, access. Uh, the first set of tests we did was with just a, uh, a fiber optic arrangement uh, that we developed with uh, Scott Sanders, who's one of the professors in our group, who is a whiz with lasers and optics. Um, basically, uh, he took the uh, emission signal from the engine to an FTIR that had been suitably modified so that you could actually get crank angle resolved measurements of the signal, the spectroscopic signal. Uh, and we ran this in our engine. And there were actually two locations, one in the uh, bowl and one outside the bowl. So here's the fiber looking down into the bowl. So you're just looking at a line of sight down the, uh, ac the op optical axis path of the fiber, and one above the bowl or in the squish region here. So uh, this shows the. <coughs> results running the engine. Here's the pressure trace. Here's the heat release. You can see some evidence of low temperature combustion in the overall um, pressure trace. Uh, we also show the modeling results shown in red here dotted. Uh, but these are experimental results. So what we're looking at here is just after the low temperature combustion phase, the uh, first stage combustion, uh, we're looking at a being in the bowl, B being outside the bowl. And you can see there already start to appear some products of combustion as identified by looking at the wavelength of the emission, the light emission, um, that have already started to appear in the bowl. And that's as we expect, because that's where that last pulse of uh, N-heptane was uh, directed. Uh, and here you see the reactants. You can see some slight uh, reduction due to that uh, consumption. So as we go on in time here, here we are starting on the second stage combustion. You see quite a lot of uh, products, species, species that can be identified as being products, CO2, water, and so on, and less uh, fuel. 
and you start to see something happening in the bowel region, in the squish region. And then uh, as we reach uh, closer to the peak heat release, you see now uh, products being identified above the piston. And then finally, the burnout of the reactants and products uh, everywhere. So that was very uh, useful information because it confirmed that what the models were seeing uh, locally were actually um, being seen in the experiment. So uh, the next step in this was to see if we could uh, collaborate with uh, the Sandia group. Uh, this is Mark Musculus's engine again. To um, actually visualize the RCCI combustion uh, over the entire combustion chamber. So here's his engine. We have this bowditch piston with the mirror here looking up through the transparent piston. We have a view through the uh, exhaust valve, one of the exhaust valves replaced by a window. Um, and in this case, instead of using port injection of gasoline, uh, which Sandia's rules said would be difficult to uh, implement in the time we had available, we used a GDI injector side mounted uh, in the engine. And so the GDI injector um, injected the gasoline early in the cycle. Uh, here's from the side mounted GDI. So this mixed the gasoline with the, inta the intake air such that we uh, could control the background low reactivity fuel. Um, okay. Again, this was iso-octane instead of gasoline using uh, iso-octane as our surrogate. Now, the common rail injector, which is uh, located, located up here, is used to inject the diesel fuel. So here are the images that were uh, obtained by Sage uh, Kirkjohn working with Mark Musculus. Um, the image on the left shows the view seen through the piston window. Um, so this outer edge you see here is the bowl, or the visible part of the bowl. And then this image is seen through that uh, window through the exhaust valve. Uh, and here's the bowl and the liner. So you can, you'll be seeing uh, combustion in these two regions. So <clears throat> here's the cylinder pressure that was measured during the combustion process. Just for reference, the motored pressure trace in green. Here are the two fuel injection events uh, using the recipe that we determined from the CFD. Uh, and then here's the corresponding heat release, the red curve derived from the pressure trace. Uh, operating at four bar IMEP, 1200 RPM, intake temperature 90. Uh, you can see the other things here. Notice the equivalence ratio <coughs> in this case is quite lean, around 0.4. No EGR. Okay, so here you see the first injection, then the second injection, and now you start to see combustion moving in from the outside in this case. The way we had this thing configured, the richer or the more reactive fuel was located above the piston and caused combustion to progress from the outer side of the, above the piston toward the central part of the combustion chamber. So depending on how you do the injection, how much fuel you put in each pulse, you can actually control where combustion starts in the chamber. And in this particular case, uh, it was uh, at the outer edges. So let me show that again. The first injection, second injection, uh, and then the combustion progressing in a very well-controlled way. It's, it's HCCI, all right? It's homogeneous charge compression ignition except it's not occurring everywhere at the same time. It's occurring in a staged fashion across the combustion chamber in accordance with the local reactivity of the fuel. So actually, if you look at this, the, at the view through the, uh, uh, the window in the exhaust valve, you see it's actually starting more or less above the piston bowl edge. I'll show that again. Look at this right-hand picture here. You notice that some of the first injection goes all the way to the liner, but it's mostly around the edge of the piston where the ignition is occurring. Again, you can change that by changing the amount of fuel in the first pulse, and you know, you have a lot of control. Okay, so um, this was for the heavy-duty engine, both in Mark's lab and in our lab. We also compared 
the light duty engine cases. So we were interested in comparing com conventional diesel combustion with reactivity controlled compression ignition. Uh, and we wanted to compare it the same compression ratio that you would have in a diesel engine, the same boost, the same intake manifold temperature, the same swirl, keep everything constant and just operate either with RCCI or with conventional diesel combustion. Uh, so just to give idea about the simulations, this is a simulation study uh, uh, validated with some conventional diesel data I'll show you in a minute. Uh, it was for that GM 1.9 liter engine. I've shown you all of this before. It's a half liter displacement compression ratio around 16.7. Uh, using the ERC Kiva code with uh, the reduced primary reference fuel model with iso-octane and heptane to model diesel and gasoline uh, for simplicity. And then the ERC spray models. The injector is a Bosch common rail uh, with the specifics shown over here. And here's a picture of the light duty engine com uh, combustion chamber geometry. Notice it has a deep uh, piston bowl with a re-entrancy here. Uh, it's typical of a, of a conventional diesel. So in order to uh, explore the operating characteristics over a fairly wide range of operation, we uh, refer to this ad hoc group from Oak Ridge's uh, publication where they basically said that they could represent the FTP uh, cycle, the EPA cycle, drive cycle, by operating at five operating points where the uh, weighting associated with each of these points uh, is reflected by the size of that circle. This is a plot of load versus speed. And you notice that most of the loads are below nine bar uh, and 2,600 RPM. So here you see uh, these five modes, the numbers, the speed going from 1,500 to 2,600, IMAP from two to nine, um, so the baseline uh, conventional diesel combustion NOx numbers from Euro 4 calibration are uh, shown here in grams per kilogram fuel. Uh, but the target uh, for meeting the tier 2 bin 5 targets taken from this paper here uh, are these values. So what we thought of is, okay, let's see if we operated similar to the conventional diesel case and accounted for the amount of diesel exhaust fluid that would be needed to be able to drive the NOx emissions to the target levels. And we then subtract that from, or add that to the fuel that was uh, consumed by the conventional diesel. Let's compare that against RCCI, which doesn't require diesel exhaust fluid. So basically that was the idea behind this uh, comparison. So this just shows the conventional diesel Euro 4 operating conditions. Uh, down below, I'm showing the experiments and the uh, corresponding model calculations for uh, four of those modes here. Um, and you can see the injection timings. This is for conventional diesel. There's a pilot injection followed by the main injection uh, for each case. And you'll notice the combustion occurs kind of late in the cycle here. And this is done for NOx control, right, in the Euro 4 calibration. Uh, but even with this uh, late in, uh, timing, the NOx numbers are still uh, much higher than tier 2 bin 5. Uh, but what we did then was to take these operating conditions, the EGR rates and temperatures and so on, and use those uh, calibration uh, parameters, if you like, in our RCCI simulations. So then, <clears throat> first thing though was to make sure that the models uh, were performing satisfactorily for conventional diesel. I showed you the pressure traces a minute ago. Here you see predicted NOx versus the experimental NOx, predicted soot versus the experimental soot, the simulations <coughs> on the green here. Reasonable results, not perfect, but reasonable. And the gross indicated efficiency. Uh, this summarizes, if we uh, take these five operating points and weight them with the size of those circles that I showed on the previous plot there, weight them, we can look at the cycle NOx and soot. So this is the NOx and this is the soot. Compare the experimental and the calculated. And you can see we're doing quite well. Similarly with the gross indicated efficiency. See numbers around 38% efficiency for this uh, Euro 4 diesel. 
The NOx is the problem, right? You can see here is the tier two bin five target that we that the engine needs to meet, uh, and so there needs to be a significant reduction in NOx, and this is done with the SCR, the, the selective catalytic reduction, and diesel exhaust fluid uh, in the conventional diesel. So when you do that, you can it turns out you can benefit and actually uh, improve the fuel efficiency by moving the combustion from late phasing, or late timings that were needed to try to get NOx even as low as they, are, as they were here, to uh, now we have this SCR fluid, we can uh, essentially operate more efficiently with our uh, diesel engine. So now we can uh, uh, change our phasing and operate at uh, more efficient combustion timings. So we took that into account also in our simulations. So this just summarizes the comparison then. Uh, there's a lot of data on this slide here, but I just want to point out that we ran conventional diesel and RCCI over the five modes, which cover the range of IMEP from two to nine bar here. Ran with the same speeds, the same total fueling and uh, intake temperatures and pressures. Uh, and then uh, here uh, where the details differ, for example, with the RCCI, we had those two injections. Uh, the amount of fuel in each injection was uh, optimized. Um, the other thing uh, that I wanted to mention here um, was uh, obviously there's no um, gasoline in this conventional diesel case. Uh, for the light load point, which is kind of the idle point, we found that actually the engine operated pretty well with RCCI just using diesel fuel. So basically, you'll see we have no gasoline at the first operating point. But all the other operating points uh, were run with both diesel and gasoline. Uh, bottom here shows the amount of diesel exhaust fluid that would be needed to convert the uh, conventional diesel combustion uh, NOx to values that meet the tier two bin five target. So let me just show that in more detail here. Uh, here I'm looking at one operating point, that's the high load operating point, nine bar operating at 2600 RPM. Uh, this is operating with 15% EGR. The <coughs> plot here shows the NOx in gram per kilogram fuel out of the engine as a function of the main start of injection timing. So the Euro 4 used very late start of injection timings or relatively late start of injection timings in order to keep NOx at some reasonable number. If we allow the start of injection timing to uh, advance, obviously NOx increases, uh, but in order to keep the NOx down at the tier two bin five target level, you would now need an uh, increase in the amount of diesel exhaust fluid to convert the NOx or reduce the NOx back to nitrogen. So there's an optimum because the way we see this is the total fuel consumption is the diesel exhaust fluid plus the, f the fuel. So in the case of uh, s conventional diesel combustion, uh, if you look at the gross indicated efficiency here, uh, there is a peak point if you inject somewhere between around eight degrees before top dead center. But that point then corresponds to quite a lot of uh, uh, diesel exhaust fluid being required, as shown in this plot here, this is diesel exhaust fluid, uh, to bring you down to the target NOx. So there's an optimization which we've pursued and found that it's better to operate uh, with a slightly retarded timing uh, and find a new optimum that's based on the two fluids that are used. So there's a peak efficiency trade-off between fuel consumption and diesel exhaust fluid consumption. In any case, if you look at the numbers here, you see we need somewhere around 5% for this operating point, 5% of the total fuel supplied to the engine is diesel exhaust fluid. <coughs> so that increases the fuel consumption by 5%, right? Of, um, as shown here. With RCCI, we don't need any SCR fluid. Uh, the gasoline amount or the gasoline diesel ratio is what controls the timing and we choose those to be optimum to meet the NOx and pressure rise rate uh, constraints. And as I mentioned, mode one, we just use diesel. So that's one of the advantages of this uh, dual fuel strategy here. 
but you can start the engine just like you start a diesel engine because you're using diesel fuel uh, at light loads. Okay, so this plot here shows the NOx versus those five operating uh, mode points. And I will start by looking at the um, Euro 4 calibration, which is the red data here. Now, notice this is a log plot, okay? And as you increase the load going from 2 bar to 9 bar, you see a big increase in NOx with the Euro 4 calibration. Uh, it's, as you notice, the weighting that's given to these points out here was kind of small because you don't spend a lot of time there in the FTP cycle. But nevertheless, these are high NOx levels. If you take the same uh, combustion uh, uh, strategy, but now you allow the spark timings to be uh, altered such that you get uh, improvement in gross indicated efficiency, or peak gross indicated efficiency, you further increase the NOx. Okay, but now you need the d diesel exhaust fluid plus some rearrangement in timings to bring that down to the target tier uh, two bin five values, which are these blue data points here. So by using diesel exhaust fluid, we can bring the black data points down to the blue points here and meet the target emissions. The green shows RCCI without the need for any after treatment. You get the same result at idle because we're using diesel, right, uh, without any gasoline. But then at the higher load points, you see we're really getting a benefit in emissions, uh, NOx emissions. I already showed you we have very low particulates. I'm not even discussing this, the conventional diesel particulates, which uh, require a, a filter, a, a diesel particulate filter. I'm only talking about NOx here. Okay, if I look at the gross indicated efficiency, uh, here is my Euro 4 calibration. Uh, we saw the average of this over the cycle was around 38%. Um, here I see the uh, VIN 5 calibration, the blue data point. Uh, we obviously improve the efficiency here by phasing the combustion more effectively, but we of course have to use DEF fluid to bring down the NOx. This shows the RCCI. Uh, gross indicated efficiency. Significant improvement over the conventional diesel. And the plot on the right here shows the pressure rise rate for each of those modes. All of them are below 10 bar per degree, so they all, all of these combustion modes would be uh, considered suitable. So this summarizes the results. If I now take that weighting over the five operating points, and I look at NOx over here, RCCI has a weighted NOx number way below the tier 2 bin 5, which we achieved with CDC using uh, DEF fluid. Uh, if you didn't use the DEF fluid, this is what your NOx would be. So to reduce the NOx required uh, that 5% uh, DEF, for example. Uh, and this is what the, the uh, Euro 4 baseline uh, NOx looked like. Here is the soot. RCCI soot engine out basically is negligible. Uh, the CDC bin 5 NOx case still has fairly high soot, this grams per kilogram fuel here over the cycle. Uh, and here's the gross indicated efficiency. RCCI giving you a good roughly 8% fuel efficiency uh, improvement over conventional diesel con uh, fuel consumption when you account for the fact that uh, SCR fluid is it required? And for our assumptions here, we said that SCR fluid would basically cost you the same as diesel fuel. Uh, and so it doesn't matter whether you're discussing DEF or diesel fuel. Yeah? So we have, as I showed you in the movie, we don't have combustion occurring everywhere in the combustion chamber at the same time we are able to stage the combustion. So it starts in the regions where you have more diesel fuel and ends in the regions where you have more gasoline. So the combustion duration is extended uh, in such a way as to avoid a bang. Spatial in homogeneities, correct. Uh, okay, so uh, the one downside to RCCI that we're gonna talk about uh, tomorrow also, uh, is that the unburned hydrocarbons 
are higher than you would see with conventional diesel combustion. And so this requires some additional considerations. And next time when we talk about after treatment, uh, we'll discuss some of the current uh, activities in this area. Most of those hydrocarbons, it, it turns out, come from crevice-originated uh, hydrocarbons. So you bring in gasoline fuel while the intake valves are open, mix it with the air, you compress it, and during that process, some of the gasoline goes into the crevices in the ring pack, just like in a gasoline engine. And then during the combustion process, <coughs> they, they hide from the combustion. During the expansion process, they come back out again into the combustion chamber and they are then, they avoid combustion, they are then exhausted uh, into the exhaust. In the spark ignition engine, you have a three-way catalyst, which operates because there's no oxygen in the exhaust, that can get rid of those hydrocarbons. In the case of lean uh, compression ignition combustion, there is oxygen in the exhaust, so the three-way catalyst is not as effective. So one way around this is to redesign the ring pack. Go ahead. Remember, the gasoline is coming in the port injection, and the direct injected fuel is just the diesel. So it's the gasoline that's making these unburned hydrocarbons. Yeah, but there's only one fuel. Yeah, not for this one. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about that, I think, tomorrow. Uh, we actually have an engine with two injectors, one for gasoline, one for diesel, and we've seen reductions in hydrocarbons. The other, though, is to redesign the ring pack. A diesel engine has the worst possible ring pack design for this type of combustion because uh, basically you don't get fuel into the ring pack in a conventional diesel. Gasoline engine does have that problem, and so they spend a lot of time designing the ring pack such that the top, top land or top ring uh, crevice region is minimized. So that's been an effort that we have recently uh, done. I'll show you some piston designs that we're currently running that look more like gasoline engine pistons. All of this was with diesel engines, Dies diesel engine pistons. Okay, so <coughs> RCCI, you see, offers us uh, opportunity for high efficiency operation. Uh, Derek Splitter, who's one of the grad students uh, who graduated recently, and uh, I joked with him, I said, you're not gonna graduate until you can show 60% thermal efficiency. So he took me at my word, and he showed 60%, as I'll show you, close to it. So we, we, were, we allowed a little slot there. So he ran our heavy-duty engine at, to kind of understand the combustion process and to calibrate a GT power model, which was then used, like we showed on the first day that we met, he used the GT power model to, f to suggest ways to get to 60%. And then he went to the lab and tried them. That's what I'm going to discuss now. So he ran at, uh, in this case, uh, 8.4 bar, 1300 RPM, with our, uh, an improved piston design that had lower surface area than a conventional piston. By having lower surface area, you reject less heat uh, and lose less heat to the coolant. Um, here are some of the other parameters, no EGR, um, he ran over a wide range of intake temperature and global equivalence ratio. So global means the equivalence ratio considering both the fuels, the diesel and the gasoline uh, fuels. And what he noticed was he could only operate the engine in a certain band shown between these two lines here because if you operate too lean, you find that your combustion efficiency deteriorates. You basically have unburnt fuel exiting the engine. And if you run too rich, you have a pressure rise rate that basically can destroy the engine. So as you increase the intake temperature, you see these two lines starting to converge. And eventually, they meet at the point where the engine would be running an HCCI operation with one uh, equivalence ratio everywhere. Anyway, there were these points where he was able to run, and he looked at the gross thermal efficiency over the range that he could run, and he found a peak uh, operating point, somewhere around 54%. Uh, 
for this particular engine that had a compression ratio uh, of around 14.8, which is relatively low. All right, but the point is he was able to run the engine. He was also able to uh, explore what happens uh, when I change the percentage of premixed fuel versus the global equivalence ratio that includes the premixed plus the injected fuel and identify a range where you would get this peak efficiency. He ran the engine with 3% uh, ethyl hexyl nitrate mixed with pump octane, uh, 91 pump octane number gasoline from the store down the road for direct injection. And for port fuel injection, he ran with E85. Remember I showed you earlier we were getting high efficiencies with E85. The reason there is the reactivity difference between E85 and diesel or E85 and the doped gasoline is much larger and so you get more control over the combustion process. Um, anyway, uh, these were useful experiments because he used them to calibrate his GT power model. So GT power, if you remember in our discussions the first day here, uh, can be used with a Wibby function for the um, combustion process and so on. If you've measured your heat release rate and so on, you can feed that into the GT power model and basically match your experimental data. So here's his experimental data uh, of the compression ratio that I showed you. Uh, his efficiency is closely matched with GT power. And uh, the friction efficiencies then come from the GT power model, uh, combustion efficiencies, and so on. So this is basically calibrating this simple uh, code. Then the question was, OK, let's say I want 60% thermal efficiency. What do I have to do? So the first thing he noticed was, well, you can really improve the efficiency. He was able to show 59.7 here with GT power. If I increase the compression ratio, it's from 14, 15 to 18.6. Uh, the next thing that I have to do if I want to increase the uh, efficiency is I have to reduce the amount of heat loss. OK, that's a challenge. And I have to increase the intake pressure. I have to dilute the charge more to get the kind of equivalence ratios that are needed to give you this, uh, this, com this combustion efficiency. So how do I reduce the heat loss? Well, what he did was he, <coughs> uh, the conventional diesel pist piston looks like this for the heavy duty engine. This was that bus tab piston with the 14.8. He made a piston that was basically a disc shaped combustion chamber. And he turned off the under piston cooling jets. You have oil jets that cool the piston in these heavy duty engines. Uh, but of course, what they're doing is trying to cool the combustion situation when you have high temperature combustion. But we have low temperature combustion here. And in fact, cooling the piston hurts us. We want to minimize the temperature difference between the gases in the combustion space and the piston temperature itself. So by turning off the under piston cooling, uh, he was able to reduce the uh, heat transfer coefficient or heat transfer losses, which show up as a change in the heat transfer coefficient. So those are the, what GT Power told him to do. So he went to the lab and uh, made those changes, changed the piston and so on, and got these results. This shows the gross thermal efficiency or gross indicated efficiency as a function of the charged base equivalence ratio. So he was running here with 40% EGR. So uh, basically, this is uh, an equivalence ratio that takes into account the fact that some of the air has been displaced by uh, EGR gases. Uh, six bar IMEP. He was able to keep, as I'll show you on the next slide, the combustion at exactly top dead center. Remember, we showed. Uh, when we were doing that analysis uh, right at the beginning of this course, that the best place to have constant volume combustion is at top dead center. But you don't want very short duration because that leads to losses, and we're able to control both uh, with this strategy. Uh, measuring the gross indicated uh, efficiency is tricky because you have to have very accurate fuel flow measurements. So he had two different ways of measuring the, uh, the fuel flow rate. One based on the air and fuel flow rate measurement, and the other based on the carbon out of the exhaust. And there's some slight differences because you do lose some carbon down into the ring pack and so on. 
But if you look at the data, we're between 59 and 60 percent efficiency if you're running at equivalence ratios around 0.25. So close to 60 percent was actually seen in the lab. Uh, if you take one of those data points here and analyze the, uh, the energy budget, what he's showing here is the gross thermal efficiency in the dark color here with under piston oil cooling and without under piston oil cooling. And we gain about uh, roughly a percent or more than a percent, 1.4 percent by turning off the, the cooling. Uh, at the same time, though, we also see a reduction in the heat losses um, to the exhaust, which uh, is interesting. That means we're getting some additional work. And that's... Uh, shows up in the improvement in the efficiency. So doing that uh, energy budget was very instructive. Uh, you notice there's a small component of the energy budget that goes in unburned fuel. That's an area where you could gain a little bit more efficiency if you could burn that fuel. So this shows the pressure trace that corresponds to this uh, high efficiency operating point. The experiment showed 59.1 or uh, somewhere close to 60%. Uh, gross thermal efficiency. You notice this, the heat release curve is centered right at top dead center. We can do that because we changed the ratio of the two fuels. The two fuels, as I mentioned, was uh, E85 and uh, octane or cetane improved gasoline. Why did we use cetane improved gasoline? Diesel fuel is relatively less volatile, and we were worried that with diesel fuel it might penetrate across the combustion chamber impinge on some surface and form a film, and we would lose that fuel. So we wanted a fuel that remained volatile for the uh, reactive fuel. The dotted lines that you see here correspond to the GT power curve fit of the experimental data. In order to match the experimental data, he found he had to reduce the GT power uh, heat transfer coefficient as was predicted. Uh, notice that the pancake combustion chamber geometry also explains some of the improvement in performance because there's less surface area when you have a disc-shaped combustion chamber versus a complex piston uh, with bowls and so on. So having matched the data here, the question was, this is what we measured, 59% thermal efficiency. What would happen if you had run the engine with 100% combustion efficiency? and no heat transfer. If you were able to completely uh, isolate uh, the engine, insulate it rather, so you had no heat losses, well, you see you can increase the efficiency by a further uh, few percent. We ran with EGR here. If you had instead, if you were able to run the engine with air dilution, this is 90, our measurement is 94 percent of the maximum theoretical efficiency. So that's pretty impressive. Uh, in terms of getting as much as you can out of this combustion process. Yeah. It's low temperature combustion. We're running with 40%, 42% EGR. No NOx, no soot. So peak temperatures are around 1,800 Kelvin. The gamma, yeah. So that's another thing you're benefiting from here. But, but the compression ratio effect outweighs that, right? And we're running with a higher compression ratio. So the question is how to further increase the efficiency. So if you go back to the first lecture here where we discussed, uh, and actually was the performance metrics part of the first day, I uh, referred to uh, George Lavoie's paper. And he goes through all of that in that paper, right? Uh, basically, you know, compression ratio is a huge knob. Um, Chris Edwards, for instance, has this uh, this rapid compression machine arrangement at Stanford where he ran at a compression ratio of 100 to 1. One cycle. And if you analyze the results there, you see he's getting efficiencies above 60 percent, 70 whatever percent. Uh, and that's possible. But the problem there is that the gases, uh, the, the gamma is decreasing 
as a function of temperature. And there's also losses, you know, very hard to seal. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. Okay, but you want work out of the engine, right? Yeah, but I care about the Sure, sure. So, you know, a fuel cell is 100% efficient if you don't draw any power from it, right? <laughs> <laughs> the same thing here. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, you're saying that there are some um, trade-offs, and that's absolutely correct. The point was, though, that Derek's uh, goal was to show what the maximum efficiency was for this particular engine. Uh, the operating point here is, is important. You know, this is a point that was optimum for this particular engine with these fuels, you know, uh, at this speed. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that goes on. but. W he chose this after having run that engine for four years, and he knew exactly where he shouldn't run and where he should run, and this is what he was able to achieve. So, yeah. So tomorrow, I'm going to be talking about robustness and so on for a vehicle application in more detail. But control is it's where it's all at, right? If you can't control the combustion process, it's never going to be practical. And what I'm going to show you tomorrow is that because we have this extra knob, this fuel ratio, you actually gain a whole lot in control. Uh, absolutely, yeah. So, but, you know, that uh, a measurement of cylinder pressure to provide feedback uh, is something that's common now. That's, you know, um, BMW, other companies have relatively low cost pressure transducers as part of a standard engine. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's see. I, the last few slides here uh, have to do with extending the RCCI load range. I'm not going to go through them in a lot of detail, except to show just a couple of pictures. We had discussed before ways that you might control or improve the control of dual fuel combustion. We have, at the moment, uh, one of my students has developed a, a redesign where we now have two injectors placed in the engine, one for the gasoline, one for the diesel. Actually, we're even using the same arrangement to look at butanol and butanol mixed with uh, butyl peroxide in a project we have with the CFRC uh, to try to understand uh, some of the chemistry mechanisms for these fuels. So you have a lot of flexibility here. You can inject this gasoline in multiple pulses. You can inject the diesel in multiple pulses. And you can really control the reactivity gradients in the combustion chamber uh, with this approach. Of course, you also have a huge number of possibilities, and that's where GA optimization and the computer come in. So that's a big part of the study. Uh, one of the things that we've noticed is that you can also use the combustion chamber geometry uh, to help control combustion. So, for example, if you look at the standard piston, heat transfer losses are higher in the squish region than they are in the bowl. So if you inject the fuel into this region, uh, watch the fuel vaporizing, the latent heat uh, that is required cools down the charge locally. The extra heat transfer also uh, can uh, cool the charge further. You can delay combustion. Uh, and this becomes really important when you're talking about very high load operation. Um, so we've done a GA. I'm, again, I'm not going to go into the details of this here too much, other than to say that this is just one example where we run with one injection of gasoline uh, fairly early, like 100 degrees before top dead center, then another injection of gasoline around 40 degrees before top dead center, and then a final diesel injection. And in that way, we're able to control combustion to meet 2010 emissions levels at 20 bar IMEP. So this is very high load operation. Uh, this is a project that's funded by Caterpillar. They could care less about light load. They're only interested in high load operations, so that's why we spent all our time here. Uh, you can see from the results here, 
we're getting reasonable efficiencies, even at this high load, uh, you know, in the 50% range, while keeping pressure rise rates more or less under control. Um, these pictures just show some details of, of those injections. So, with two independent direct injectors, we see that RCCI combustion control can be achieved even at high load operating points. Uh, or as we've seen from the results that I just glossed over here, the details of how you inject the less reactive fuel can uh, be important because you can achieve local cooling with the less reactive fuel as it vaporizes. Uh, and uh, basically, more work is needed. <laughs> so, to finish up here, um, CFD modeling can be integrated with efficient optimization techniques to help you improve engine design. We would not have found this RCCI combustion strategy without CFD. Uh, in fact, I had students trying dual fuel combustion before we started the modeling uh, some years ago, and uh, they gave up on it because they were telling me, well, the engine's going to blow up. Um, so it was the CFD that really gave us the recipe. And this is just one concept here, right? I believe that new combustion strategies can be discovered using this uh, combination of CFD and experiments. Uh, the RCCI idea basically has been explained and validated using experiments. Uh, uh, we also have seen that you can, you, you can operate this with a, widely, a wide range of fuels. It's very fuel flexible, using even a single fuel with an additive. And tomorrow I'm going to show you some results uh, that we obtained um, on the engine with single fuel additive for a light duty engine. Uh, and then finally, these type of advanced low temperature combustion strategies allow you to have high thermal efficiencies, even as close as 94% of the theoretical efficiency, and that simultaneously meet NOx and soot emission mandates without the need for uh, after treatment. So just uh, this last set of pictures here shows the difference between operating at the same point with HCCI and RCCI. And with RCCI, you see much slower combustion process than you saw with the HCCI. Much better control over combustion. Question? Yeah. Great question. I'm having trouble convincing the industry to accept two fuels. <laughs> maybe, maybe you're a more persuasive salesman than I am, and you can get them to choose three. Uh, well, <laughs> you, I mean, so you mentioned E85, and yeah. um, the bigger difference between it and diesel being uh, beneficial, what about like a compressed natural gas? And so the question is, what about compressed natural gas? <coughs> I'm repeating it for the camera. Uh, yes, we have a project right now where we're looking at natural gas diesel. We've done simulations that show it's a wonderful fuel for RCCI. Uh, the octane number is over 100, 110, something like that. Uh, and uh, so you get a wide range of reactivity. And in fact, what we found is that uh, it's actually better to use three pulses uh, for the injection in that case to really control uh, the details of the heat release, especially at high loads and light loads. So. Yeah, there's a lot that can be done. Other questions? Yeah. So, shorter duration tends to approach constant volume. Mm -hmm. but, and uh, so, when you're increasing a duration a little bit, how does that still? So, the question is why don't we want a, sh a really short duration? If you go back to the, uh, for the combustion event, if you go back to the first day's lectures and take a look, You'll see that if you have very fast combustion, you typically have high heat losses that, are, that correspond to that. Um, you can imagine that you're going to have uh, uh, you know, uh, convective velocities that are set up. You also, um, instead of dragging out the combustion event, you're going to have uh, periods where you have high temperatures for a longer period of time, leading to higher NOx. So having a reasonable duration of combustion 10, 20 degrees is actually preferable. All right, any more questions? Okay, so tomorrow is the last day, and we'll talk more about applications. Uh, I'll talk more about RCCI in a vehicle, and also what I think of for the future of engines. See you tomorrow. <laughs>